Well, this morning we are in Nehemiah chapter 5, which should not be a surprise to anybody, because uh, last week we were in Nehemiah chapter 4. And so I want to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing here in Nehemiah chapter 5. Nehemiah chapter 5 is a very interesting chapter, because up until this point, it's been talking about building the wall, right? It's talking about the difficulty and the opposition, those that are against us. And then all of a sudden, who do we get to in chapter 5? We get to those that are doing the work. We get to the Israelites. And so as we look at Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 1, here's kind of where we, uh, we pick up. And this is what's going on at the time. It says, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. Others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Still others were saying, we have to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. Although we are the same flesh and as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have been subject to, we have to subject our sons to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because the fields, because our fields and vineyards belong to to others. So here's where we're at in Nehemiah chapter 5. The work has been continuing on, but people got to eat, don't they? And they don't have enough money. And so they have been making deals. They've been taking loans, mortgaging their fields to other Jews that are wealthy. There are other Jews that have money, and they're going, this doesn't seem fair because we're all doing the same work. We're all doing the same thing. So why is this happening? And this morning, here's the question I want us to to answer. This is the question I want us to answer this morning. How do you respond to a brother in crisis? How do you respond to a brother in crisis? And Nehemiah chapter 5 gives us some insight into how we can respond to a brother in crisis. How many of you remember the big uh, housing bubble pop of 2008? At that point, we we were living in San Diego out in California. There were parts of California where housing values dropped 25 to 30 percent. Now, I don't know how it hit New Jersey. I don't know, did it hit New Jersey as bad? I mean, it didn't, it, where I was at in Virginia, it didn't really hit Virginia real bad in that area because of all the military. But did, did you, you guys remember when the bottom fell out on the housing market 2007, 2008? It was hard, wasn't it? It was a hard time. And one of the things that made it that much harder was this, this predatory lending that was going on. Banks were lending people money that should not have been lending Money. There was actually a book written about uh, the, the housing crisis. It's called The Big Short. The Big Short. Now, it, it, they made it into a movie, and I can't recommend the movie uh, because uh, I watched a few minutes of it. The, the, the movie has horrendous language, and so I can't recommend that, the movie. But here's what happened in The Big Short. Uh, there was an investor that figured out that banks were making loans, and so they started doing uh, these swaps. And they were basically selling mortgages to other companies, and they were building almost imaginary funds. People were throwing money into the mortgage, into, into the, the, the housing market. And this investor had made, he, he noticed these things, and he started selling uh, prospective futures on, on mortgages. And he was betting on one thing. He was betting that the housing market was going to fail. And so he started selling these swaps and selling these. And I'm not a financial manager, so I'm not going to explain it right. But here's what he did. On all of the investments that he was selling, and it was just paper money. It wasn't real money. It was was prospects. They were were forecasting things. And he was counting on the money. He was counting on the market to fail. And so he took out insurance against his investments. And when the bubble popped, he made 500% on his investments. He was counting on other people's misery to make money. You know, we have this happen all the time. People are, uh, they're predators. They prey on those that are in need. During World War I, 
At the end of World War I, there were 22,000 more millionaires than there were at the beginning of World War I. You know why? Because war was big business. Profiteers. They made money selling weapons and armor. In World War II, it was worse than that. There were 50,000 more millionaires. People love other people's misery because oftentimes it's a great opportunity for them to make a buck. And in that book, The Big Short, that's what it was all about. It was all about how the housing market was set up to collapse and and implode on itself. And we all remember it. I have friends that lost their homes. You probably do, 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 you probably do as well. Maybe you lost your home. And when you look at what happened, you see that there were other people that were set up. They were waiting for it to fail. This is kind of what was happening in Nehemiah chapter 5. There were people that needed money. And there were other Jews that had money, and they were loaning them money. But not only were they loaning them money, they were charging them interest. They were charging them interest. And so if you look at Nehemiah chapter 9, or verse 9, chapter 5, verse 9, here's what Nehemiah did. Nehemiah pulls them back, pulls in all these people with uh, money. Actually, in verse 6, it says, When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was angry. Jumping down to verse 9, so I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and men are also lending people money and grain, but let us stop charging interest. You know, in difficult times, people need help. People need help. But the question is, how do you respond? And here's the first thing that I pulled from this. Here's the first thing I pull from this in in Nehemiah chapter 5. If we're going to give, give without strings. Give without strings. Oftentimes, people will give of their time. They'll give of their money. And they'll expect something in return. Even a church. Well, don't they know how much money I've given that church? Okay, so were you tithing or were you tipping us, expecting to get a better seat later on? Actually, what what does the book of Matthew say about giving? Here's what it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 2. It says, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When we give, we have to give without strings. We have to give without expectation that we're going to get something back for it. We give out of obedience. We And this isn't just financial giving. When we give of our time. That's one of the things I love about children's ministry. Uh, I, I'm, I, clearly, I'm biased about children's ministry. But when we serve in a ministry, we serve people that we're not going to get anything for it from them. We're not going to get anything from them for it. We're not going to get anything from them for helping them at the door. We're not going to get anything from some... Listen, I, 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 he's not overly shy, but he doesn't necessarily like a lot of attention. Have, do you guys, you, you, how many of you know Bill Lloyd? I, I hope you know Bill, Deacon Bill. Deacon Bill has been mowing the yard here and working the grounds, and we've got a wonderful crew that helps him. Uh, we always could use more if you're looking for something to do. There are always more. But since 1984, Deacon Bill, 33 years, 33 years, we as a church could never repay him what he has saved this church. And he doesn't do it for the attention, That's, but I can, I, can, I, can, I can point it out because I know he's not overly shy. Some people, if you point it out, they're, they're like, okay, if you do that again, I'm done serving. But Deacon Bill, we're never going to be able to pay him back for what he does. I managed a facility down in Virginia that had a little bit less land than, than Calvary. I know it cost us $39,000 a year for a landscaping company. Do the math, 33 years. Here, here's, here's what we understand. When we give of our time, 
when we give of our money, when we give of our love, when we give of our energy, when we give of our efforts, we give without strings attached. That's what Nehemiah was telling them. He said, I and my brothers and my men are also lending the people money and grain. But let us stop charging interest. Let us stop expecting to get back more than we're given. That's what, that's what they said. And here's why it's so very important. This is why it's so very important. Because we might be making a profit in the short term when we start expecting more. But when God gets a hold of us, when God convicts us, our temporary profits can cost us more later. What, what's Nehemiah say here in verse 11? It says, give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the interest you are charging them. One percent of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. What did he say? He said, give them, give them back what they gave you, and then give them a little more. It reminded me of uh, Zacchaeus. You guys all know the song from, some, from kinder, or not kindergarten, from Sunday school, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. People didn't like him because tax collectors, they cheated people. And so here's what happened when Zacchaeus met Jesus. This is why I want us to keep in mind that we have to give without strings and that when we get temporary gains, sometimes it can cost us more later on. Zacchaeus, after Jesus came to his house, here's what he said. In verse, chapter uh, Luke 19, verse 8, it says, But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. When God gets a hold of our heart, generosity, generosity becomes the way we deal with people. Generosity is the heart of our Father. It's the heart of Jesus. And that's what we see in Nehemiah. That's what we see in Luke. When we give financially, when we give of our time, when we give of our energy, we should never give expecting that it's going to be returned. If you're expecting that it's going to be returned, then you're not really giving. You're paying somebody. We're not paying We're not investing in the sense of we're putting money in a bank here on earth. No. Where do we store our treasures? In heaven. Here's the great thing. When we learn to live as generous people, it changes our perspective. Now, I love what Nehemiah says in here. If you look in verses 12 all the way to 18, Nehemiah had all sorts of rights as the governor. He was the governor of Jerusalem. He was the governor of Jerusalem. If you look in verse 14, here's it it just I'm skipping around a little bit. It says, Neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver. If you want to know how much 40 shekels of silver is, it's about a pound of silver from them, in addition to the food and wine. And that was every day. But out of reverence for God. I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for work, and we did not acquire any land. Furthermore, this is his right as a governor. 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Every day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. And every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this... I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on the people. When we are in a position of authority, of leadership, of abundance, what did Nehemiah do? He laid down his rights. It was his. He could have taken all of these things. But because of the work that needed to happen, he laid down his rights. How many times do we get upset because somebody cut us off in traffic? Somebody took our parking spot that was a little closer. And we ended up parking out over here. 
How often do we get upset because somebody didn't say thank you? We get offended. We get hurt. We get upset because somebody walked by us and didn't say hi. And you say, well, Pastor Spencer, that wouldn't happen. That's, I wouldn't do that. Listen, I have been a pastor for 20 years. The things that people have come to my office about that they were upset over. The classroom next to me has newer scissors than mine. True story. Pastor Yvonne, okay, I've only been to this for a few years. Yep, yep, listen. They didn't give me the donut first. They gave it to the other person. They ignored me. They hurt my feelings. Did you get a donut? What are you complaining about? You got a donut. There's times that people get offended. Why? Because they feel like their rights have been violated. We get offended because we feel like somebody has done something intentionally to hurt us. What, you know what the hard thing is? We want people to judge us on our intentions, but we want to judge them on their actions. I meant the best. Should, they should know that about me. You know what? The person that you're upset about, they might have meant the best too. Maybe you just need to trust them. But what do you have to do? You have to lay down your rights. Lay down your right to be offended. Lay down your right to be upset. Jesus had all sorts of rights, didn't he? What did he do? Did he ever sin? Did he deserve a death on the cross? Deserved nothing of the kind. He did it because he laid down his rights. We have to do that same thing. It's hard to do that. But if we give without any strings attached, if we give generously and selflessly, then it becomes easier as we start looking at it with grace and mercy in our eyes. We begin looking at it realizing that person that upset me, they probably didn't mean to. Maybe they're having a bad day. You ever done that? Maybe that person that cut you off in traffic. They could just be a New Jersey driver. <laughs> but then again, maybe they're, they're having to get to the hospital for something. Do we give people the benefit of the doubt? Or do we assume that we're right to be upset? Nehemiah tells us so very clearly, I have all of these rights, but I lay them down. I lay him down. Paul talks about the rights he had as an apostle. Did he take advantage of them? No. No. Sometimes we can think more of ourselves than we should. And when we do that, what happens? We get our feelings hurt. We get offended. We get upset. We get upset. We get offended. We get hurt. We, we leave. We break relationships. If we're going to have good relationships with one another, guess what? Then we're going to have to let go of the right to be offended. Because people are going to say things. They're not always going to say them right. Sometimes they're going to say them wrong. They might say it. It might be hurtful. They might not mean to. But it happens, doesn't it? It happens. Heather and I have an agreement because I, I, I can have uh, something of a sarcastic tongue at times. It is the family I grew up in. I am a product of my parents, and so I, bl I blame them. Um, we have an agreement that if something can be taken one of two ways, I'm in it the good one. Do we do that for other people? If it can be taken one of two ways, if it can be taken good or bad, do we, do we assume they meant it good or do we assume they meant it bad? Yeah, most of the time we assume they meant it bad. But if we lay down our right to be offended... It's hard to offend somebody that has decided they won't be offended. Yeah. That's what Nehemiah did. He laid it down. He laid it down. But why did he lay it down? 
Nehemiah gave of what God had blessed him with. He loaned people money. He loaned them grain. Why did he do it? Well, if you look at the end of verse 18, it says, because the demands were heavy on these people. That's why he never demanded the food allotment. And then in verse 19, remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. Nehemiah laid down his rights, but Nehemiah gave to complete the vision of God. If he had demanded repayment, if he had demanded interest, what was that going to do? It was going to stop the work that God had called him to do. If Nehemiah had paused every time somebody had done something offensive, if he had paused every time somebody had done something hurtful, the work would have stopped. But he gave so that the work of God could continue on. And who did he ask for recognition from? Did he ask for it from the people? No. All he says is, remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. What did Luke chapter 6 say? Or Matthew chapter 6 say? He who sees what's done in secret, give with a generosity and a heart that says, if the only recognition I get is when I make it to heaven, I will still give. If the only acknowledgement I get is from Jesus, when I'm standing in front of the throne of God, I will still give. If Pastor Spencer never sends me a thank you note, I will still give. If no one ever says thanks for serving in children's ministry and youth ministry, if no one ever says thank you, I will still give of my time, my energy, my effort, because I'm serving God. What we have to do is we have to focus on the work of the Lord and not the returns that come back to us. Focus on the work of the Lord and not the returns. If we believe that God is faithful, now that's a big if, isn't it? If we believe God is faithful, then we will live like God is faithful. Doesn't mean we won't have troubles. Doesn't mean we won't get our feelings hurt. Doesn't mean there won't be disagreements. But it does mean we'll lay down our rights and we'll trust God to take care of our needs. That is faithful living. That is faithful living. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do we value more? Our money, our rights, our respect, or the work that God has placed before us? That's a question, isn't it? Are we willing to give of ourselves so fully that we lay down our rights? That we give with no expectation of ever receiving anything back for it? Are we storing our treasures in heaven so that when the day of the Lord comes and we stand in front of the judgment seat of Christ, we can hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or is God going to say, yeah, you already got your reward on earth because you made a big deal about what you did. Listen, my encouragement this morning, let's be people that give generously with a heart that says, God, you can have my money, my effort, my time. 
You can have all of my life because it's not mine. It's yours. And let us be a people that says, you are my brother and my sister. You will always be my brother and my sister. And therefore, there is nothing you can do that will stop me from being in relationship with you. I will not be offended at you. Let us lay down our rights to be hurt, to be offended. Let us lay them down and let us trust that God's going to take care of us. And let's just worry about one thing. Are we serving the vision that God has placed in front of us? Because I told you last week that God has a vision and a purpose for you as an individual. He has a vision and purpose for us as a church. The question is, are we willing to work in that vision if we give all that we have and get nothing back? Are we willing? Are we willing? That's my challenge to you this morning. Let's be a people that gives all we have. God has placed a great task in front of us as a church. We're called to be a lighthouse in our community. It's in our name. God has strategically placed us in this community. I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think it's happenstance or luck that we're where we're at. We have a beautiful campus. We have wonderful people that call this church home. God has called us to move forward, to build a community of believers that other people want to be a part of, to preach the gospel. Last week we had four people respond for salvation. That's amazing. We should celebrate what God is doing. We're doing a baptism service in August because we have a dozen people waiting to be baptized. We have people that desire a greater portion of God. You are essential to that work. If we are going to be a church that focuses on reaching those that do not know Jesus yet, we have to give generously of our time and our finances. We have to lay down our rights and we have to trust that God sees what we do. Do you want to be that kind of church? I want to be that kind of church. Stand with me.